everyone. Welcome, welcome. So great to see you this Sunday. Uh, we're just going to go into a time of music and worship here. So feel free to stand with us if you'd like or express yourself in this time as you'd like. must be well and it's an old hymn that we uh, kind of made a new rendition of and put a new melody to and wrote a little new chorus to as well so hope you enjoy it the words are on the screen if you'd like to sing along Fruitful if in Christ abiding, 
Steadfast through the Spirit's guiding, all must be well. We hope be the thing with feathers perched in our souls. Sings a tune without the words, never stops at all. Through joy, sorrow, die. Expect a bright tomorrow, all will be well. Faith can sing through days of sorrow, all is well. On Creator's love relying, Jesus every hope supplying. Yes, in living or Through joy, sorrow, dark and light, all must be well. We're going to say a prayer together. It's just one chunk of text, and feel free to read it out loud with us if you'd like. The words will be on the screen, um, but know that it's optional and you don't have to. We come together to rest, to think, to form friendships, and to serve those in need. We celebrate God's light in every person. We are each fully loved by our Creator, and our imperfections are welcome here. We know that church is also imperfect, and we proceed with grace while holding it to the high standard of love. We gather not just to build community, but to activate community. Use us, Lord, now and always. Amen. It's in you I find my home, and you I find my home, and you I find my home. It's in you I find my home, and you I find my home, and you I find my home. It's in you I find my home. 
In you I find my home. In you I find my home. La 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 la. La 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 la. La la. La la la. guilt and all my shame you release me from it all you release me from my pain all my guilt and all my shame you release me from it all yeah you release me from my pain all my guilt and all my shame you release me from it all. Oh, take me. Oh, take me. Take me as I am. Lying at your feet again. Oh, take me. Take me as I am. Lying at your feet. you take me as I am you're not asking for perfection I come into your presence and I don't fear rejection cause you take me as I free to have a seat. So great to be with y'all. My name is Greta. If I haven't met you yet, I'm just going to share a few announcements today. Um, The first one is um, after meeting with our leadership team and the Trinity Heights leadership team and uh, referring to the CDC and all of those things, um, this is our last Sunday 
in-person gathering where we are requiring masks to be worn. So starting next Sunday, um, it is optional, um, ideally optional if you've been vaccinated. And um, we just wanted to clearly communicate that to all of you guys um, that it will be optional starting next week. Um, and if you have any questions about that, we would love to talk to you about it. Please know that we are open and available for conversations about that. Um, and we are continuing with our live stream um, on YouTube as well. So that's going to continue from here on out, which we're really excited about as well. So that's that big update. Um, next, we have some fun things up and coming. This Friday is one of our immigrant family food share events, and we've been doing that twice a month um, where we provide food for families in need in town, and we would love your help with it this time. Um, so, many of you so many of you have helped in the past bringing food to fill the trek or coming and helping us pack boxes, um, but the specific need we have this time is uh, to bring certain food items. So on our giving table, out in the back, we have a sign-up sheet, and um, it specifically is about this event, and you can sign up to just bring 10 boxes of cereal or uh, 10 bundles of bananas or those kind of really specific things. So make sure if you're interested in helping, you check out that sign-up sheet um, and write down what you would like to bring, and then we will reach out to you, and you could either either bring those to us on Friday at 3 o'clock, or if that time is not good for you, we can figure out another time to connect for that food handoff. Um, also, last year we started a new tradition for the Commons where we take one week in the month of June and we um, really have our own kind of Commons pride celebration to honor the LGBTQ community in Flagstaff. So we're doing that again this week and we're really excited for it. And we have three specific events that we want to invite everyone to. Uh, the first one is going to be on Monday, let's see, June 19th. And nope, that's not it. I'm lucky. I want to talk about Monday, June 14th. Okay, so um, if you hadn't heard about this yet, um, Kyle and I and uh, Jay Mercado over here, we all uh, worked with a team of other musicians and other organizations to create a 10-song album dedicated to queer youth of faith, specifically. And that album just released this past Friday, and it's called Serenade. And we're really excited to have it out in the world and breathing and um, hopefully being impactful in people's lives. And we just want to have kind of a celebration listening party to this album. So we're going to set up at our office, get some good quality speakers and all those things that Kyle nerds out about. And um, we're going to just hang out and listen to these 10 songs, uh, maybe pause after every two songs and talk about it or reflect and that kind of thing. So if you're interested in coming to that, um, we would love to see you there. Um, on our Facebook page, we're going to make an event and kind of try to get some RSVPs so we have a general idea of how many people come, um, just so we know if we need to move to a bigger venue space. But uh, mark your calendars for that and please come. And even if you don't want to come to that, um, that Serenade album is on Apple Music, Spotify, all the things. So um, you can check that out just by hopefully just searching the word serenade and looking under albums, or you can go to our Towers um, Spotify and then scroll down to Appears On, that section, and it's right there. But um, I encourage you to listen to it and be encouraged, even if you're not a part of that community. I think it is still um, an encouraging album. Uh, and then a couple more things. On Wednesday, June 16th, we're going to have the queue. We have the queue um, every other month, and that's just a time where we gather and uh, put in anonymous questions in a hat, and then Charlie talks about it, and everyone talks about it, and we want to have a cue specifically focused on this topic, because um, I know that that is a big enough topic on its own sometimes, so if you're interested in that, if you have questions about it, um, we would love to see you there, and we're going to have people also from the LGBT community there, so it's not just Charlie blabbing about that, so don't worry, um, and that will be uh, yeah, at our office at 7 p.m. on that Wednesday. And then the third event I'm really excited about, our friend Kevin Garcia is a um, non-binary pastor from Georgia, and they are going on tour and stopping in Flagstaff, and we are hosting them for an event. And it's going to be here at Trinity Heights, and it's going to feature a couple guest speakers and uh, a time of meditation and really just encourage, encouraging words. And the topic of the, that time and that event is wonder, comma, fully made. And the question that they're all kind of discussing is, what does it mean to be in wonder? Um, so we just encourage anyone and everyone to come to that if you're interested. Tickets are for sale online. If you look on our website, you can go to our events page and see the link to purchase tickets to that event if 
Um, so those are that, and we're really excited about that. And if you have anything else you want to add to that, please let us know. All right, lastly, the Commons Camp Out. We're doing it this summer, and not just one night, two nights if you want. Um, or you can just come for one night or just come for dinner or whatever. But we're going to be camping in Flagstaff, uh, probably just down Fort Valley somewhere. We'll drop a pin once the date gets a little closer. But um, Friday night, July 2nd, and Saturday night, July 3rd, and then packing up and leaving that morning of the 4th of July. So save those dates if you want to come camping with us. We always just get a big lot, and everyone kind of spaces out and have a big campfire, hopefully, if that's allowed, and it'll be a really sweet time. All right, lastly, I'm going to invite Brian Graham up to the stage, and Brian Graham is our new youth ministry director, so let's give him a hand. Hello. So Brian just officially started in this role on June 1st, so we're really excited to welcome Brian into this position. Um, some of you probably knew Ryan Kegel, who was doing this position before and just moved back to Oklahoma, but we um, know and love Brian, and he's been a part of our community for many, many years and is on our leadership team and um, just is an amazing person who has an amazing heart for middle school and high school students. So I'm going to let him take the mic and talk about what's going on. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll keep this real quick. Uh, really excited, first of all, to uh, get this opportunity. Um, it's been, uh, today in particular, has been visiting all three churches who are involved in the youth co-op. And so that in itself has been um, a little churched out by now. But it is, uh, it is exciting, though, to see, uh, to see something like this happen that Ryan started so long ago and the Commons joined um, with the Church of the Epiphany and now uh, Trinity Heights is going to be joining us as well. Um, it's really cool to see kind of walls come down in between churches and I'm very excited to be a part of that. Um, just real quick history for me is youth group was a home for me um, in high school when my family was getting smaller and smaller and more broken. Um, I found a very large family through um, my youth group and which carried on to outside of high school, had a chance to serve there, and it just became, uh, I found that you can really have, um, I found like a whole new life in myself, I think, through those, through that time, um, being plugged into a caring, loving youth group, and that's kind of what we're hoping that happens here. We create a safe, fun, loving, connecting place for middle school and high school students, and yeah, so very excited. Sweet. If there's any middle school or high school students in here today, you're welcome to follow Brian out the doors, and we're going to uh, go to the youth room and have a time that's made just for you if you're interested. It's optional, but that will be a sweet thing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Greta. Brian, I can't tell you how excited I am uh, for Brian Graham to be leading the youth co-op. He was born to do that, and he's just nerdy enough that he's the perfect guy, which is, we're so excited about that. Hey, welcome. If you're visiting with us today, we're always thrilled to have uh, people come and check out the Commons, and we hope you feel welcomed and safe. Or if you're watching online, we welcome you as well. We like at this time to always pray for another church in town, and we've kind of been going down the church row here, and we're kind of running out of churches, but down farther on 4th Street is a church called Canyon Chapel. It's a four-square gospel church, and uh, we're going to pray for them. If you're the praying type, we'll, we'll lift them up. Lord, we thank you for um, this day, the beauty outside this community we live in. We thank you for the connection of a diverse body around the world, as always. And Lord, um, we're thinking in our hearts today of how much we love Canyon Chapel. And we thank you for uh, the gift of how they've served this community for so many years. And Lord, we ask you to draw us all closer to each other uh, in your love and be connected in that. We also pray today as we begin to look at the Gospel of John that you would open up our hearts and minds for us in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know, um, I don't know how well you guys know Kyle and Greta. Um, I know them really well. They're some of my closest friends, and I don't know if you could sense that they had a little extra joy or pep in their step as they were singing today. Could you feel that joy emanating from the stage? Liz is nodding. She was up there with them. She could feel the energy. Yeah, we found out, Kyle actually, which is so great, he coaches Solace, who I think I just saw walk in here, in soccer, and it was the last game of the season, so he got everything ready early so he could go coach this last game right before, and Solace scored his first goal in the last game of the season, and I've never seen Kyle and Greta more excited or happy. I think they have found the thing that fits inside the hole in their heart, and uh, it was really, really thrilling. It's pretty, pretty cool. We're proud of you, Solace. You're, you're a beast. 
Yeah, it was fun. I, it's kind of a time of uh, transitions this time of year. That's our last soccer game. I went to my nephew's graduation party last night. A lot of you have kids that are graduating, or we're all transitioning to summer. And I think this is a really exciting time, and it's a really, really fun time. We, in our family, we had a little tiny nerd transition because uh, my youngest son, who's 10, he just finished reading the Harry Potter books which is what allows him and unlocks the ability for him to watch the final movie. So this morning, actually, my family watched Harry Potter 7, like the second one, which is a really big deal in our family. And I don't know if you remember this. Years ago, I told the story. I was not originally a Harry Potter fan. Originally, I thought that was just a kid's book, wasn't interested, but my wife got really, really into it. And the seventh book came out, and it was a really big deal all over the world. At midnight, Walmarts were going to be open. And anyway, she fell asleep in our hotel room. And even though I didn't like Harry Potter, I snuck off, got in a car where we were in Colorado. I drove down to Salida. Everything was closed, and then I found a Walmart, and all the books were right there behind the glass, but this tiny town Walmart was closed. But it said, like, midnight, June 15th release. So I ended up getting, and about 12, 15 people showed up, like me, hoping to get the book, and they wouldn't let us in. There was just a janitor in there cleaning. And I ended up going around where the trucks loaded in and broke into the Walmart, and this person came and, like, was yelling at me, and I said, no, no, I, I, know, I understand, I'm, but can you call your manager and tell them that I broke in? And they were like, what? And they woke up their manager at midnight, and I was like, can I talk to her? And uh, they were like, what? And I was like, can I talk to your manager? And I said, hey, there's like 15 of us here. And anyway, she ended up waking up and coming down and unlocking the store and sold us like this book. But the reason I share that is because of what we're going to talk about today. I did a really weird thing. Now that I'm such a Harry Potter nerd, back then I didn't care at all. And there was all this buzz about Harry Potter, if he was going to live or die. And I got that book for my wife, and I went and I sat in my car. And the very first thing that I ever read in Harry Potter was the very last sentences of the Harry Potter book. So I got the ending of the whole seven series before anything else, just because mainly I wanted to have that power over my wife, that I knew what happened. Um, but I think it's interesting. I actually know people who go to the end of the book first to see what it's about, to see if it's worth reading. Are there, are there any of you psychopaths in here that do that? Did I not make that safe to raise your hand in that particular case? There are people that do that, and that's actually what we're going to do today. Uh, after I call you all psychopaths. We're going to start a series that I'm extraordinarily excited about. We're going to be talking about the Gospel of John. This is going to be the summer of John. Uh, it's been a couple years since we went through Mark like this. Um, from time to time at the Commons, if you're not familiar with the way we choose things, we kind of mix it up. Sometimes, like other churches, we follow the liturgical calendar and the readings that the whole global church is reading. Sometimes we just follow the seasons, or like we just finished a topical thing, Welcome Home, where we looked at the pillars of our community, but we finished that. But also from time to time, we like to just go through books of the Bible and try to mine from them some sort of value or something that's transformative to us. And for the Gospel of John, I wanted to start at the end or near the end, and, uh, and I don't have this up on the screen because I didn't tell Trey about this first. But in John chapter 20, verse 30, the author says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, the reason I wanted to start here is because I feel like the author is kind of explicitly giving a nugget here about why they wrote this book. They're saying, I want you to hear these stories of the person Jesus that I knew, so why? So that you can have life in his name. So that there's some connection to the fact that there was something so significant about this person who we often say was the most attractive personality that ever lived, that something about believing into the way of being that is following Christ transforms our life today, and it gives us more life. It's kind of a foreign concept, especially as a lot of us struggle with what church is and what Christianity is. One of the things that keeps me rooted in this ancient faith, in this ancient wisdom, is what John is saying right here. There's something about looking closely at the life of this person who they called the chosen one, which kind of relates to Harry Potter, or maybe it's the other way around. The chosen one, the Messiah, the Son of God, that can change the way we experience our life today. And I think that's really important. Usually I end with a so what, but I thought today I would start with a so what. Of There's really no point in spending all these weeks going through and looking and mining through the riches of what John wrote a couple millennia ago unless it means something, unless there's something about believing into Christ that changes the way we love our families and our friends and maybe even most impressively our enemies. So that's the kind of the wet your whistle into the book thing. But today what we're going to do is we're going to dive right in. And what, what we're going to do is look at the first section of John. It's called the prologue. 
And it's arguably one of the most famous and deep theological things written in the entire Bible. Scholars of John would say that it's written in kind of four different sections. Uh, among all the Gospels, and this is what I spent most of my education and career studying, specifically the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, which are the other three, which are very much like each other. Synoptic means one eye. It's like they have one perspective. And then you have this fourth Gospel, John, which is so different. It's like a different eye looks at the life of Jesus. It's a different way of seeing who Christ was. And what's so unique is that the other four Gospels focus on, and, and famously Irenaeus in the, in, the first, in the second century said that what's beautiful about these Gospels is the first three, the synoptics, are so um, poignant in the way they highlight the humanity of Jesus. And John comes in with his fourth Gospel and shows us the divinity of Jesus, shows us that there's something divine in the way this person existed in the world and the teachings of this person. It's kind of the crescendo of theology when you look at the life of Jesus. It all kind of builds up to John's gospel. I'm just trying to hype it up. This is like a trailer for this whole series because it's actually my favorite gospel by far, even though it's kind of the weirdest. It, it contains stories that the other gospels don't have. We wouldn't have the story of turning water into wine or Lazarus being raised from the dead. It, it adds things that the synoptics don't do. But the thing that I find and what I want you to hear more than anything else that compels me about the book of John is Jesus feels bigger. And this is really personal to me. In my own faith journey, which has been uh, over years and different states and different theological degrees and raising kids and having hard questions and walking through death and life and all the things that all of us do in this crazy thing called life, I have found that sentence to be true for me. Jesus seems to just keep getting bigger. And there's a sense for me in which John, who wrote this probably as an old man, scholars disagree about who exactly wrote it. It's probably the latest gospel. Its final form was probably completed near the end of the first century when a whole explosive movement of Jesus followers was branching off in different countries and different dialects. And this one old follower of Christ, who was probably in his late teens or 20s when he actually followed Christ, as an elderly man who'd been through life, wrote of Jesus as if Jesus was somehow even bigger at the end. That compels me. That's something that lights my spirit a little bit inside when I think about what it means to follow Jesus. And he doesn't disappoint at all when he begins his gospel in the prologue before he goes into these other sections. I'm going to start in John 1, 1, and we'll skip around a little bit. It says this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is probably one of the most famous passages in John, probably outside of John 3.16, in, in America anyway. And it's this beautiful beginning that these first century listeners would have felt a lot of connection points to that we might miss. First of all, even in the English, you probably notice the in the beginning phrase. You, you know that the Jewish scriptures began in the same way in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. Bereshit bara is the Hebrew phrase. We, we had to memorize this at the University of Texas, the whole Hebrew thing. And these first followers of Christ who were a mix of Jewish followers and Gentile followers. We had Gauls who were led by powerful women. You had people in Ephesians and Turkey, all these different places in the modern world that back then were coalescing around Jesus. And it was rooted in this Jewish tradition that began with creation, ex nihilo, from nothing came everything, life and light. And John, this author, is very much plagiarizing on purpose. He's trying to create a connection to this audience that in the beginning was the beginning of everything, life and light and beauty, which, by the way, is what Genesis 1 is. It's the most beautiful poem of, of ascending creative beauty that you could possibly write or articulate about God in this incredible world we live in. He's saying in the beginning was the Word, and this is where he varies. And this is where he's reaching out to his Greek audience. He starts with in the beginning, and his Jewish listeners are going, I'm following with you. And then he says, in the beginning was the logos, and the Greek audience was going, okay, now I'm following you. Because logos was this word that Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and Epicurus, they all like to write endlessly and spill endless ink talking about the idea of the divine logos or word 
or reason or logic. And what they meant is, is this sort of like argument of the organization of the universe. They saw that there was this sort of order to the whole universe, that there was laws that governed it and reason. And they said, we must understand why that is. And that's where they came to their own ideas about the gods or God, that something organized these things in such a way that we now call the teleological argument, if you want to be put to sleep. It's this idea that everything is so fine-tuned and perfect that there's some sort of great mind behind it. And so John, this author, in just one sentence, is reaching out to his Jewish spiritual followers and his Greek philosophers, and he's saying, all of that stuff I somehow saw tied up in the person of Jesus that I knew so long ago, who just kept getting bigger. So it's a really beautiful beginning and prologue, and he ties it to light in the darkness, which I've spent a lot of time every year at Christmas Eve services going over how much I tie to the scientific idea of photons and light and the mystery that is our whole world, light by which we see all things, but I don't want to go too far off that because we, we, you have to save that for Christmas time. But I want to skip down to verse number 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, talking about Jesus here. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. I, I like this because I, I really like to remember or remind myself the eyewitness aspect of this, to remember that the person who wrote this, when he's talking about we've seen with our own eyes the glory, this, this person saw Jesus and watched Jesus do these things and experience these things and love his enemies and turn the other cheek and have the wit in the moment to say, who is he who is without sin cast the first stone. He watched the glory of God embodied in a human being. We often say, if you want to know what God looks like, one of the central teachings of Christianity is that you look at the face of Jesus, that there is something that we can grasp. There's something physical and tangible that we can look to and understand how to be and exist in the world. And I love that he ties it to this beautifully simple familial concept that we can be children of God. I, I think in my life, the things that uh, are most emotional to me, and I'm sure you've experienced this as a child or a parent or a sibling, is familial connection. That's what gets our eyes watered up. It's graduations, it's goodbyes, it's, it's births, it's first soccer goals. Those are the things that connect us. And John is creating this bigger and bigger circle that this way of being in Christ, that this gospel is about, that you might have life, ties us to this simple idea that we can be children of the divine. And this was not, this was not something that people thought of all that much in the ancient world. You have to remember that the whole Bible itself is an example of this kind of progression of understanding God. This is something that really draws me to the Gospel of John. You know, one of the things I think that we get messed up sometimes in American theology and church is this, we inherit this view of what the Bible is. We're taught that the Bible is some sort of magical book that comes down and every single word was magically spoken by God, and we have to somehow come up with some systematic theology that ties it all together. And the reason I often try to call this out is because it's a very damaging view of God and the Bible. It's a very low view of the Bible. The Bible is so much messier and more colorful and richer and deeper than that because it, like Jesus, was fully human. Humans wrote about God and fully divine. And just like the church, which is fully human and messed up, but also has this mysterious wind of divinity in it, the Bible is the same way. And in the Bible, you see this ancient way of experiencing God that begins with this kind of, God must be like us, warring and angry and violent and jealous. But then you have these prophets that say, no, he doesn't want the sacrifice of animals. That doesn't make any sense. You see people wrestling with what sort of thing is God like. And one of the things that keeps me so anchored and excited about the Christian faith is that it doesn't just end with all these philosophers and prophets and people wrestling with what God is. It says that God had a face. There's this building story that builds the idea that God actually isn't violent. God is radically nonviolent. God actually isn't exclusive. God is actually radically inclusive. And even when Christ birthed into the earth through Mary's holy womb, and even as the world was transformed today, Christians are still struggling with what God is like. And here's what I want you to hear about the Gospel of John. I promise you that God and Jesus can keep getting bigger. One of the things that breaks my heart in the religious world and that we live in is that Jesus keeps getting smaller. I experienced that most of my life in church. 
as harder questions came into my realm, as different experiences and people came in and ethical dilemmas, Jesus to a lot of people just gets smaller and smaller and more controlled and into a box and ultimately becomes someone's alter ego where they're just projecting their own hatred or their own insecurities or their own needs. And I'm sickened by that because the real Jesus, the real divine stuff gets bigger, becomes more a part of our life and more transformative. So here's what I want to challenge us to do. During this summer of John, I want you to read the book of John. We're going to kind of hop through it at different places, and I'm excited where we're going to go throughout this whole thing. It begins with this wonderful prologue, and then there's going to be about 12 chapters, which scholars often call the book of signs. And John was a brilliant numerologist. Everything was sevens. There's seven signs that he, he teaches us about Jesus. There's seven I am statements as he began to expand the idea of what Jesus was. The synoptic gospels were edgy enough when they said Jesus was the son of man and maybe even the son of God. But John took it to bigger when he starts using these I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. These statements were big and growing and expansive, and that, that set those 12 chapters then lead into a, another book that they call the Book of Glory, which was literally seven full chapters that was just the last night of Jesus' life. And we have recorded some of the last teachings of this great rabbi from Palestine 2,000 years ago. And then you have the book of passion and the story of death and resurrection. And John has it in such poetic and beautiful terms in the way he understands the pulling off of the mask of what death and resurrection look like. I hope all of this just excites you a little bit to join us in reading a book together. A lot of years we do a summer book club, but this year we're going to just do the Gospel of John together. Read through at your own pace. Hopefully we can have discussions about it. We're going to end our time today, as we always do, at the communion table, which is also from the Gospel of John, of course, and the Passion narrative, in a remembrance of Christ and His nonviolent death and the fulfillment of His way of being that He taught. And we're going to do it in a way that I hope honors this ancient author who told us at the end of the book that the hope is that we will connect with life because we believe in the name of Christ. And at the sacrament, at the performance art, what I pray for you today is that when we come and partake together at this station with our little COVID-friendly things, that we connect to God, that we remember that Christ can be a bigger part of our life, more transformative, can be a bigger connection for us one to each other in the way that we love and open ourselves up to community and connection. And we remember Christ and we take in the forgiveness of sins and love and light at the communion table. Let me pray over it and we'll share this time together. Lord, I'm so thankful for the prologue of this old book. I'm thankful that humans have long wrestled with what it means that our universe is ordered and that there's life and light amongst darkness. And Lord, I'm thankful that in our faith, we have a center point to look at in your face. Lord, that you moved into our neighborhood, as the Greek actually says, when it says that you dwelt among us, you come and move into our neighborhood. Lord, I pray that you move into our hearts, and Lord, that we experience a version of you that is constantly expanding and getting bigger, and let that compel us to live lives of love. And Lord, we pray as we come to the communion table, as we always do, Lord, um, in the tradition of billions of Christians and thousands of years, with contrite hearts, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our mistakes, things that have hurt those near us and ourselves. Um, individually, we ask you to forgive us. And Lord, we also, very importantly, Lord, Pray corporately for our big mistakes, the systems that we're a part of, the things that we don't speak up against, the violence that we perpetuate sometimes with our lack of strength. God, forgive us and change us and transform us. And we believe, as John encouraged us, that by uh, looking in your face, we can find life. And we think of John 10, 10, life that is very abundant and full. We want that. We want that together. We receive your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Safe from dreams 
glorious light. Thanks so much for sharing your Sunday afternoon with us. We always appreciate that you come be together. As always, I want to encourage you as you leave here, make sure you look to see someone around that uh, might be new, or if you're new yourself, reach out and meet somebody new today. And as, as we always say when we leave, that's the real holy stuff when we go out the doors and, and be the church to the world. Also, we do need to stack chairs, so if you want to and you're able, uh, we're going to stack chairs when we're done. And, and there are actually two different kinds of chairs, the ones that have little wooden uh, holders in the back and those that don't. So just like separate stacks of those, and then we'll put them away if you want to do that. But I'm going to pray for us, and we'll go be together. Lord, thank you so much uh, for the joy of this day. Thanks for the joy of music, and thank you for words like light um, that we can meditate on and think of you and your grace. Thank you for John and his gospel. Lord, let this be a fun conversation that we 